Okay, I'd like to call to order this regular meeting of the Boulder Valley Board of Education for Tuesday, January 14th, 2020. Happy New Year, happy new decade. Uh, Laura, would you please call the roll? Garcia. Here. Gephardt. Here. Marquis. Here. Myers. Here. Sargent. Here. Sweeney Moran. Here. Ziss. Here. And board members, please remember to turn your microphones on every time you speak into them. Thank you. Okay. Uh, please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, I'd like to remind us all that the mission of the Boulder Valley School District is to create challenging, meaningful, and engaging learning opportunities so that all children thrive and are prepared for successful, civically engaged lives. Thank you so much for joining, here this, joining us here this evening. Uh, and we'll start, as usual, with the superintendent's report. Thank you, Board President Marquis, board members. I'd uh, like to welcome everyone back. Uh, 2020 is gonna be an amazing year, an amazing semester. Um, I was able to start last week um, back to my school visits, had a chance to visit Netherland Elementary, Jamestown, and Gold Hill. I always enjoy um, having a chance to, to head up the mountain and engage with those teachers um, and, and with those students. So it's really, really wonderful. I'll be continuing my school visits throughout the, the course of this month. Had to cancel a few this week due to uh, an illness, but uh, hopefully we'll be back up to speed here soon and hopefully we'll have those wrapped up over the course of the next month. And just continuing to really value the feedback that I'm getting from our educators, from our principals, uh, even from our kids. Uh, just really time well spent, and so those are going very, very well. Um, for those of you that, that paid attention to the this Colorado Department of Education's uh, press release today, um, our 2018-19 graduation rates were released. Um, so BBSD's four-year on-time graduation rate is 90.8 which was down a bit from last year, which was 92.1. Um, and that's in comparison to the state graduation rate of 81.1. Um, and our district's dropout rate increased slightly um, from 0 0.6 to 0 0.8, which means we had 23 more students uh, drop out this year than last year. Um, I would say that uh, we, we had some pretty significant decreases in alternative education campuses, uh, Arapahoe Ridge, Boulder Prep, Boulder Universal. Um, and we also are seeing the gap widen um, between um, um, our, our Caucasian students and our students who are Latino, um, our students who are receiving uh, federal lunch assistance, and those um, with learning disabilities, uh, those gaps are increasing. And I would say that uh, that just signals to me um, and, and validates the work that we're doing in our strategic plan that we still have work to do. Um, and that we'll be digging into these numbers with our team um, and, and that we have an obligation to make sure that each and every kid that, that we serve um, is getting our very best. Um, I'm, I'm disappointed that, that we, we did see some slight drops, uh, but I am optimistic on the work that we're doing in our strategic plan, which is heavily designed on reducing the disparities in achievement, um, bringing, bringing those strategies. And so more to come. I'll continue to keep the board informed on where we are. Um, but, uh, but that was the information uh, that was released today from the Department of Education. I want to share that with you in the public. Um, I'm sure there'll be some um, coverage in the daily camera uh, tomorrow. So that's all I have for my report. Okay, thank you. Uh, board members, any questions for Rob? All right. Yeah. Uh, I'll just hold mine when I get to board communication. Okay. okay. Uh, so our next item is a report from the District Accountability Committee. Every year the District Accountability Committee goes, sorry, uh, reaches out to all of our school accountability committees that are made up of both educators and parents, and they solicit feedback around priorities for the budget. So tonight the <coughs> DAC is presenting their budget recommendations to the board for those who, of you who are unfamiliar with the process. Okay. Thanks, President Marquis and members of the board, Dr. Anderson. Um, my name is Nicole Rajpal. I am the chair of the District Accountability Committee. And with me tonight are my fellow members of the Executive Committee, if you want to introduce yourself. Uh, Ralph Fritt. Anna Seatman. Amanda Brown. Um, and as 
President Marquis said, um, every year the District Accountability Committee is tasked with providing feedback on how the district spends their money in their budgetary process. And one of the ways that we're do that we do this is um, through communication with our, our school accountability committees, which are SACs. Um, we also uh, reflect on the strategic plan and we look at um, available data throughout the year up until um, we present to you all. And so that is a little bit of our process. Um, this year, the budget survey was different from years past for those existing board members. Um, we made some minor modifications in sort of how the questions were asked um, and how they, they were arranged. So some of the big bucket items changed. And then we asked schools, knowing that resources are finite, we asked schools to say, like, if you had $100 to spend on personnel, how would you divide that up um, to get more clarity on exactly how important specific items were. So that was a little bit of a change from years past. Um, a positive, and there's a lot of positive feedback on that. Another positive change was that we had 46 schools participate in our survey this year, um, which is up from years past. So as I said, um, one of the things that the DAC does um, in this process is really look at the strategic plan and the strategic initiatives and anchor our thinking about the survey results and our, our thinking about um, the data that we look at in that strategic plan. And this slide shows um, the, the strategic plan, and in yellow um, were themes and objectives that resonated through all of our discussions on budgetary priorities. And so our thinking is very aligned um, with the strategic plan. Okay. Um, so within the data, uh, we took a deep dive into growth, um, as always, and certain situation, certain um, themes really continued to persist uh, in our looking at growth, and that's special populations of students, so our kiddos that are um, identified as screen reduced lunch, or are Latino, or are on IEPs, continue not to meet state expectations for growth. Um, particularly in the middle school and elementary school level. And the state expectations on our charts that we show here are at that kind of green line between the yellow and the blue lines. Um, promising, however, is that in this chart on middle school, you can see that there has been a slow uptick in growth while we're still not quite towards targets. Growth is improving, which feels like a promising early sign. And then um, in the high schools and in the elementary schools, which is not pictured here, um, there's sort of some inconsistent ups and downs of growth, um, sometimes teetering over state expectations, or sorry, sometimes teetering meeting state expectations and sometimes dropping below. And then in certain populations like our gifted students or Asian students exceeding expectations in growth. Um, so resonating to the top in the, uh, around growth is that we really need to see higher rates of sustained growth, particularly um, amongst certain populations to close gaps in achievement. Um, some trends in achievement that our data subcommittee observed and wanted to share. Um, again, gaps in achievement persist across all levels um, and all groups. Um, again, with our, some of our subpopulations not meeting state expectations. Um, and here, which is um, frustrating, particularly, is that there has been little change in the past five years pictured on this, four years pictured on this graph. And so, for to us to see these changes in achievement, we need to start thinking about how, continue to think about how to put resources into growth to improve our achievement. The following slides come from our um, survey to SACS. So we asked schools to rate uh, six categories on differential at different priorities, and three categories rose to the top. Um, in a varying degree depending on school level. So one of those categories that rose to the top was student supports. And these pie charts show how within that category of student supports, different levels of schools um, would allocate funds differently within that category. Uh, and what the subcommittee observed in this area was that mental health service and resources really came to the top across all school levels. And those are the orangish, yellowish pie pieces with the stars in the middle. And you can see um, 
that there are other areas of consistency, but less so in that area. The next big bucket um, of spending priorities that rose to the top in our, our survey was instructional supports. And um, here, my little arrows are not showing up, but what really came up in instructional supports were um, teacher planning time, professional development, and math curric curricula across all of those grade levels. So the idea that we need more supports um, in the area of instruction to help uh, meet some of the school, the um, strategic plan initiatives and help close those gaps in growth and achievement. The last of the three buckets that sort of rose, big buckets that rose to the top um, was personnel. And here, um, what the group, what DAC observed um, and, and sort of came around were, um, you notice that to varying degrees, school counselors and instructional interventionists in this personnel bucket were also um, big priorities for spending across all school levels. Which again, relies, but relays back to um, some of the student supports as well as the um, instructional supports that schools are recognizing as a need. So looking at that, um, the survey results and the uh, data that was available and through our overall discussions with the DAC as a whole, um, and again, anchoring in the strategic plan, our, res our recommendations, um, while in your memo in detail, um, really boil down to mental health, instructional support, and growth-focused allocation of resources. Mental health um, amongst, when we were talking as a group, it was unclear to us the degree and the specific areas of need in that bucket. Um, we would like to see more metrics and measures, whether it is um, even just a collection of anecdotal information to really paint a better picture of where exactly our needs exist and how then interventions in that might be um, allocated. I know in the past, school counselors, you guys have, gener the, the district and the board have recommended generous funding to, funding to um, support elementary school counselors, and that is a large ongoing bucket. Um, but it might be, if we dive deep, we can find ways to leverage community and family partnerships that aren't so financially burdensome, or maybe not. But we'd like to see some more information on, on you know, what are student perceived risk? What are parent perceived risk? What are some, how, how can we more concretely paint a picture of where the needs exist in that area? In the area of instructional support, again, instructional interventionists um, with focus on math. I know math in our conversations about metrics with the strategic, strategic plan can, continues to rise to the forefront as well, knowing that math is a critical skill and can be a gatekeeper. Um, for some kiddos, uh, and the recognition that as we continue to roll out ideas or roll out initiatives, the faculty need support and professional development and the time to really plan cooperatively um, to make sure that they're implementing anything that comes down their way with fidelity. And then last but not least, um, something that's also always been really important to, to the DAC is um, allocation of resources that are allow for equitable opportunities um, that relate to closing gaps in achievement and opportunity um, and that prove academic growth. Um, and whether that, there's a myriad of ways to do that, um, but prioritizing and differentiating those funds in a way that has the biggest impact is strongly supported by the DAC. So <clears throat> I'd offer this comment. So as we, as we looked at the data, and we move on a theme from high school down to middle school, K-8, and over to elementary school, we see some really characteristic shifts. And what I want to share with you, we sent you in a separate report the detail, high degree of correlation within those buckets. So if we look at the elementary school and how they really increased on time for professional development and planning time, that <clears throat> strong correlation across a lot of schools. So in, in collecting the data this year, the way we did it with priorities and, and giving everybody a fixed set of resources, what it really allowed us to do is to understand not just what was 
uh, th those, those areas that they'd allocate more money, but what were the areas that there was already an understanding that things were adequately funded? I think that's a valuable piece of information to know as well. So as you look at the data and you see kind of the theme move, whether it's uh, dealing with instructional support, <clears throat> those were categories and areas where we saw a high degree of correlation. And so that's one of the things that had us from, as, from a data standpoint and kind of, if you will, bringing it up to see what the trends were, feeling very confident in terms of the, the trends that we're getting here and where those, um, where those educational resources at a, either high school or an elementary school or K-8 felt was the best bang for their buck. So I'll pass that on. Questions? Okay, great. Well, thank you for so much. Um, as always, you put in so much work, and I also appreciated the individual comments that you appended to the back of the report as well, because um, it's nice to hear directly from the schools in that sense. Uh, board members, any questions? Rob? I just wanted to take this opportunity to commend the leadership of our District Accountability Committee. Um, the, if you look at the detail within the surveys that they, that they conducted, uh, really, really valuable information that, that will help help our team as we as we develop our budget proposals. But um, just more importantly, I really appreciate the thought partnership that District Accountability Committee has provided um, for, for myself as superintendent and for our staff, um, constantly pushing um, and, and looking at information um, in, in the right way. So I just, I, I think these are excellent recommendations. So I just appreciate your all's leadership um, and partnership as we think about uh, making sure that we're all together for all students here in BBSD. Okay, uh, questions, Lisa. I just wanted to echo that as well, especially as a new board member, I found this report incredibly useful. There was so much information here, the degree that you, um, the levels that you went to to present it and the questions that you asked were, were really useful and I appreciated uh, all the work that went into it. Thank you so much. Okay. Kathy? I don't have much to add on the thank you side. I'm just wondering, I know you say that you need more metrics on the mental health. So we probably aren't going to have those when we do the budget this year. So were there any takeaways of things that we might want to look at for budget priorities that, that relate to mental health that you guys could share with us for this budget cycle? So as we deal with mental health, there were two, two kind of themes that emerged from the data and in, in, in we were able to discern that from the comment section as they related. One of them is that <clears throat> The, the, the school counselors have been effect, very effective, incredibly effective when we deal with issues on campus. And several of the uh, specific schools indicated that they wanted more counselors because those resources have now become saturated. So that, that's, that's one kind of category that we see. The second category that looked to be at least as important was what, what are the resources that the, the school counselor or, or the school district has for off campus? Because many of the problems that originate with these children do not deal with their behavior within the school fence. It's outside the school fence. And, and there was a feeling that the school district would benefit if it had partnerships, it had resources for mental health that, that could be coupled with the work that the school counselor is doing. So those would be, those would be the two themes that emerged as we looked under, uh, uh, if you will, un under the de data that was detailing mental health. Did, did you have any conversations when I hear that? I think social workers, because they look systemically and address issues in a different way than counselors. Did you have any conversations like putting more specificity to what that's the outside... where the data starts to fall off are we really talking about social workers or are we talking about family planning fam family counseling for trauma at home uh, that's where we get kind of not a lot of clarity and some of that information may come best from the school counselors themselves and i would add that uh, you know anecdotally we're hearing from the schools that you know high degrees of trauma high degrees of stress um, student needs are making it hard for them to, they're not showing up ready to learn in the classroom because uh, of ongoing mental health needs. So I think one, we haven't looked at it at the DAC yet, I know it's coming up in a coming, upcoming meeting, but what are our school climate, um, culture and climate survey results for the upper grades, they, dig, they dive a little bit into that. Um, 
It's a little bit of a Pandora's box for us at this time. We're getting a lot of anecdotal information, um, but it would be nice to see it, find a way to formalize a collection of that. Are, one more question, but I'll come back. Sorry. Go ahead. I'll come back. Are, are we still conducting the, uh, the mental health survey that we used to do in the past? Climate survey? The cli well, it's, it's more than the climate it's survey. It's the, oh, uh, yeah. Excuse me. Rob, are we still doing the youth risk survey? Uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. What did you say? <clears throat> Richard. Sorry. The youth risk behavior survey that was conducted by the Department of Health, I believe. Yeah, I believe we are. Um, let me get with our team, and, and I'll, I'll get you all a formal answer on that. Because that gives you a lot more than just anecdotal information, at least the ones that I used to read before in the past. And also, uh, it, 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 we still have mental health interventionists in the schools, right, as it relates to the partnership with mental health partners? As of today, yes. Uh, okay, thank you. My, my question really gets down to the uh, equitable opportunities. Can you be a little bit more specific on that? Well, we discussed in DAC, um, and as, you know, as, and as one of uh, the slides that Sam presented on the UVA project that kind of compared growth and achievement on a scatter plot um, showed that show that some schools really are, you know, not are performing at entirely different rates. Some schools have low growth, low achievement. Some growth schools have high growth, high achievement. There's a mixture in there. Um, and as we talk amongst ourselves, the opportunities are not the same depending on which school you go to. Even look at math pathways. Some schools have entirely different math pathways or access to accelerated um, language arts programs. The, what exists in schools is not entirely similar, so those opportunities are not similar. Um, and also, there are some schools and some students that need more resources, and they need more opportunities to get to where we, we hope that they can land. Um, and so that's just a conversation that we continue to have within DAC and that we want to continue to speak to. I, I have another piece. So one of the things we were able to do this year, first time for you, we broke out a set of the data we didn't present present it this evening on Title I schools, and you begin to see these needs shifting, and it becomes very, very clear there. What are the categories of need, and where are they, and how are they significant from other schools? And so what we're beginning to see is that that lines up pretty well with the strategic plan is not all the needs are uniform. When we have areas of poverty, pockets of poverty, or we have high density of, of free and reduced lunch, we're seeing different responses, and we would see those characteristically out of the Title I schools, and that's why we broke that out this year, and we were able to do that. So that'll give you another character at a broad level where those needs are different and unique in terms of the resources that they think they need. Okay. And we're going to see that information. It's in our report. Is that in the report? It's in our report. It's in our report. Yeah. Thanks. Kathy, you want to have a question? I just was hoping for a little clarification around the comments on math. Were they just needing more math supports? Or is it critical? Because I hear criticisms of our math curriculum and that it's not implemented with much fidelity across schools. I'm just curious if there's any more you can share with that. So math curriculum itself rose as a priority. And then uh, along with that, you know, if we, if we get a different math curriculum or if something around that changes, the interventions to help support it as long as it's planning time. But math curricula as a bar um, in more schools was higher than science curricula or literacy curricula. It rose to the top in that area. Meaning that we need further refinement and fair clarification on it, or meaning? So that, so that again gets to the granular level in which we did not dig, and that's a question worth asking. Is it a different curricula? Is it more curricula? Is it, what is that? Um, we did not get to that level, um, but we did observe it rising to the top. But worth, again, looking into what exactly are schools meaning when they say that. No. Um, and there was a lot of commentary about sort of this, you know, between school levels um, uh, having to bridge gaps when kids jumped a level, like not feeling quite ready for the next big jump. And is there a disconnect between what's taught? Um, and that's the scope and sequence that I know you guys are working on. Um, so again, worth a deeper dive in that topic. I'll make one quick comment on math. Um, 
I know that in our specific SAC, you know, it talked about we have a lot of interventionists that come in and do support on literacy, but there hasn't been as much interventionists that come in and do math, and so I think there's some, like, it's not that the, at least from this, the vantage point from my school and then as a middle school math teacher, um, it doesn't necessarily feel like the curriculum isn't working, but like it feels like the supports when you get kids at all these different levels. Um, I have kids in sixth grade that are from kindergarten or second grade proficiency in some of their objectives to, you know, above grade level. Um, so it's more about interventionists, at least anecdotally from the vantage point that I've seen. Down here? Can I? I just think as, as you pointed out, and I think we don't pay enough attention to how important it is to be at certain math levels as a way to be able to take upper level science and other kinds of classes. And if you fall off that track early on, it's really hard to get back on, unlike literacy, which just has a different pathway. So I appreciate those comments. Any questions? Donna? Thank you all for your hard work. It's hard to talk in the microphone and look at you, but I'm going to look here. Did you find out from, I, I do appreciate that you said you also looked at things that were working. And did you delve into it all in our special ed department? We have increased the number of certified behavior and analyst uh, CBAs. Is that an asset? Is it helping in the schools? You'll see that in the comment sections that, um, in, in particular, that, that that was something that they recognized was very helpful. I'd say, generally speaking, right. across the board, there's a feeling that that's now okay, and that and that what in and again, it's in some schools, particularly, you know, in, in the elementary, some of the or in the, you saw it in the high school, where we we could really benefit from having some more counselors, but not the behavior. So it it, it gives us the appearance from the comments and the data that we saw that that yeah, that's 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 now okay. Stacy Kitty, I had one question. Um, we I used to see the word social emotional learning. Are we done with that phrase and we've moved on to mental health in this? No, I don't know that we're necessarily done with it. Um, I think that a lot of that was um, included within the bucket of mental health and then within the counselor component of it. So I don't think that that's going away um, at all. I think maybe there's whether it was the survey itself or reframing thinking or thinking more globally about how those needs trickle up. And I know in the past years, um, middle schools and high schools have felt like some of the language that DAC has used felt more elementary based. Um, and so social emotional learning isn't something that we hear coming from our high schools as much as mental health. And so I think they're still there, but all under the same umbrella. Okay, that was a really big shift in this report. Yeah. And so I just wanted to point that out, that it, it was interesting to not see that called out. So. Right, and equity, that, the equity has been itself a category for so long, but the way in which that is uh, throughout, embedded throughout the strategic plan, we just decided that um, not use that big tagline word and think about things a little bit differently as a result, assume, with the assumption that that's embedded throughout. Well, thank you very much. Oh, Kitty. I just want to echo all the thanks and to just say how dedicated you all are to our district and putting in this amount of work to produce this report for us and how useful this is for us, that we're really lucky to have citizens like you all who are really dedicated to the district. And the other thing, it, it's not really a question, just pointed out that I was really pleased to see, especially among elementary um, schools, how important they understand teacher um, development and planning time is. Um, that's great to know that, that our communities believe that because it's true. If you want good teachers, they have to have good training and planning time. And I want to say that we appreciate all of you and the work you do and um, the positive working relationship that we have with the district and the board. Um, it really makes our work feel purposeful and meaningful, and it generates a lot more really intelligent, really eager, really optimistic uh, volunteers on our end. So I think that is really great. A funny thing, in years past, we have ourselves gone through this data and tagged a um, board area with our data. And this year we added as a question, 
who is your board area, who's your school board representative for your area? And the um, accuracy rate was sadly low. <laughs> so our schools yeah, don't well, know. Well, apparently a lot of you are serving in some other districts that, that nobody else knows about. Yeah. I, I would offer one comment to you too, is as you're going through the process, if in there's, there's something in the next couple of months that you would like to see, let us know, because we're at that process where we're reevaluating our survey and we're looking to make another layer of improvement with it so we can get a little more specificity around some of these granular areas that it would be helpful, especially in terms of giving information to Rob with the strategic plan about what are those things that are really important and might be good to accelerate a little bit. All right, well, thank you so much. And uh, 46 schools has got to be a record. So I think it is a record. I think Very it's good. a record. Thanks. Which is terrific. Um, okay, so the next item on our agenda is public participation. We recognize the value of public comment on issues related to the operation of the schools. To ensure our meeting is conducted in an orderly manner, we ask that persons who address the board confine your comments to matters that are germane to the business of the school district. Speakers on agenda items will be heard first, followed by those speaking to non-agenda items. We have both this evening. Uh, please limit your presentation to two minutes. If we go over the first hour, which we won't tonight, public comment will continue at the end of the meeting. Recognize that students often view, attend or view our meetings. Speakers' remarks, therefore, should be appropriate for an audience that includes kindergarten through 12th grade students. Uh, the board president may interrupt, warn, or terminate a participant's statement that is unrelated to the business of the district or inappropriate for K through 12 students. There is a timing system on the board desk. Okay, so we are doing new timing systems. So we're, this is gonna work though. Laura will begin the timer when your time begins. And he, this is the timer, obviously. You will see the timer count down as you speak. Laura will show a yellow card when you have 30 seconds remaining. When you have 10 seconds, you will see the orange card. Please wrap up your comments so that the board can hear from the maximum number of speakers, sorry. So we'll start with the first speaker, and uh, it's Don Bryan. Good evening, uh, Madam Secretary, board members, superintendent. I uh, salute you all with my 25-year-old Technical Education Center cap. My name is Don Bryan. And I am a 1994 a graduate of the Building Trades course uh, uh, offered by the uh, district in the uh, Technical Education Center. I am here to urge you that in addition to academic skills, I believe every graduate from high school should also have skills that will allow them to earn a living or support themselves while they continue with post-secondary education, if that is their choice. I was fortunate in having that myself when I graduated from high school and, and used my acquired skills uh, during my six years in evening school for my uh, bachelor's degree. I then I spent uh, some 30 years in the public service as a city planner and retired in 1993 in the spring. That summer, I enrolled in the program at the Technical uh, Education Center uh, in building trades. I was really carrying a lifelong carpenter's hobby into uh, a more professional area. I. Uh, completed that program in uh, the June of 1994. And the next month in July, I went down to Denver and I also obtained my reciprocal construction supervisors uh, 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 class A uh, certification. Uh, that certification, I believe, has now been superseded by an international code council uh, uh, system. Finally, I, I formed a company and uh, got a truck and tools and all that and hired some people and spent the next many years in building houses in the area. I uh, 
am grateful uh, for the, my experience at the Tech Center and uh, the fact that it gave me a, a, a wonderful second in life after my years of public service. Thank now, you. I do not know why the oh, building trades course was terminated a couple years after I graduated, uh, especially in view of the high demand locally and throughout the state. We need to really wrap it up. For, uh, 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 for construction workers. I recommend that the building trades program be reestablished and in a way that graduates, when they finish, uh, can get licensed as contractors uh, and get on with their lives. Thank you. All right, our next speaker is Christine Johnson, and let's please try to stay within the two minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I did email the board members and the superintendent, and then I previewed the slides, and I have um, some additional comments for you regarding the slides. Um, the most important thing that I'd like to see you do is to make explicit SMART goals around uh, equity and achievement gaps with your CTE programs, uh, because in this district there are families who are very good at advocating for their kids and their achievement shows that. And if we want this to help us close the gaps, then we need to be smart about how we do it. Um, I would like to see BVSD uh, expand their work with Front Range Community College, CCC Online, Workforce Boulder, the way St. Vrain is doing. Um, I would like to see better integration of your CTE programs into lower grades, eighth, ninth, and 10th. And I believe that they may help. This may help with some truancy engagement and dropout issues. Um, I'd like to see better transportation options for site-based options because I think that that cuts accessibility. Um, I'd like to see better advising about um, options going down into middle school. As a uh, high school parent and employee, I'm not seeing a whole lot about it, and that's upsetting. Um, Please consider that the way things are structured right now, that there may be structural barriers um, in language, culture, and bias um, in accessing CTE, especially for students for whom there are already well-documented gaps in overall success in the district compared to their peers. Um, and I would just say that the CTE programs, I know you're trying, they're not widely enough known about or available, especially the site-based programs. Um, I feel like BVSD is um, very biased towards college and it's not the only route. And this is also a route to make college more accessible um, and, and more affordable for some. So thank you. Okay, Luisa Matias. Superintendent Anderson and members of the board. As co-chair of the education team of the NAACP Boulder County, I have been engaged with closing multiple gaps uh, for students of color and low SES. The 2019 Trends Magazine report by Boulder Community Foundation shows 11% fewer limited English learners and economically advantaged students graduating in four years than Anglos, and I guess it's even, it's gone down. While there are a number of areas we are looking at for ways to close this graduation gap, one we feel has the highest potential is to provide more career and technical education with NBVSD. Some Denver metropolitan area school districts like St. Verain School District, Jeffco, Denver, and Adams 12 have implemented various successful CTE programs. Other things to consider from the trends report are students of color are disproportionately under-enrolled in IB and advanced placement courses for which they can get college credit at a vastly discounted rate. Students of color and students in poverty are not pursuing higher education, especially males, at the same rate as their peers. Studies show students are saying a big reason they do not want to have student is because they do not want to have student loans to pay off. Concurrent high school and community college enrollment would help with this problem. 
I am mentoring a young DACA mother who is at Front Range at Front Range Community College. She had, was able to get her oldest son into P Tech at Silver Creek and high school in Longmont. Until his P Tech enrollment, his future looked dim, but he's succeeding in P Tech. His IBM mentor who served, started with him before school started in ninth grade will continue with him until he graduates from Silver Creek and Front Page Community College. This is the type of success I want to see for the Boulder Valley School District kids. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Dave Pence. Hello, my son's a senior at Boulder High School and I'm a third generation carpenter. Uh, when my son was a freshman at Boulder High, I met with Dr. Hill, the principal, and made an inquiry about my son being able to take credit classes in precision machining at Front Range Community College in his junior, senior year. Um, I also inquired about mentorships and apprenticeships. I was told that BVSD uh, had dual credit reciprocity from Front Range to accommodate students who wanted to take academic classes for graduation credit provided those classes were not offered in BVSD. Uh, there was no graduation credit provision for students wanting to take career in technical education and skilled trades training classes outside BVSD. I was also told that Boulder High School had no programs for mentorships and apprenticeships. I told Dr. Hill that with all due respect, there was indeed a way for students to have a mentor in the community and that there were district course codes that were assigned to a sponsoring teacher. He asked me how I knew this. And I told him that I was a retired BVSD teacher with 17 years in the district and had been the CTE construction trades instructor during the 2009-2010 school year. Before our program was terminated and before we got the opportunity to build tiny houses with our students. I also informed him that my doctoral thesis was in the area of school to work transition for at risk students and that I found that community members were extremely important in helping those students gain self confidence and make progress toward finishing high school. So what's the lesson here? Does it come down to supporting students who want to follow career path with a college background and less support for students who select a skilled trades career with technical classes and apprenticeships. So since I'm out of time, I'll email members of the board, give you some of my recommendations. Um, and I support the areas in which Arlie is currently moving with CTE. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Peggy Dar. Hello again. Uh, my name is Peggy Dara, and I have kids that are in the second and fifth grade at Ryan Elementary. Uh, both of my kids were born in our current house, zone for Ryan Elementary, Andrevine and Centaurus. Both. Oh, so birth trends from 1998 to 2018 include my births. However, the majority of the kids, my kids' friends that go to Ryan do not fall in the Boulder births, uh, which was part of the data that I saw last meeting when it came to the update of the enrollment count and, and analysis trends. Um, I'm guessing that the birth trend supports the five-year bubble that I was told when it comes to Ryan Elementary um, overcrowdedness and why we're having Band-Aids for this overcrowded school. I learned a lot at the last meeting and will continue to learn more about BBSD every meeting I'm able to attend. I found the presentation on enrollment especially interesting because it's why I was at the meeting and why I'm here again today. I'm sure there's a team of people whose job it is to analyze the data, which includes student growth and declines. I would think by looking at the data and talking to city planning, the district could do a better job at predicting what ha might happen in the near future and prepare to react effectively. Parents and principals have been raising their hands asking what BBSD is doing with the new, about the new neighborhood zone for Ryan Elementary. Can we redraw lines? I was heard that that was political suicide, whatever that means. 
Uh, I'm doing my best as a PTA president, raising funds, getting academic tutors, trying to do what we can to help these overcrowded schools. My ask today is please do better, BBSD. Look at the data, see the anomaly, which should have been bolded in the enrollment summary. Lafayette strong elementary growth of 136%. Have some urgency. We shouldn't have to wait seven months for a portable for our school that is overcrowded. We're not gonna, we had the numbers in August, we could have had them in May, and we've already outgrown the portables that we're not getting till after spring break. Thank you. Okay, so our next item is board communication. Uh, board members who would like to begin. I want to thank all the public comment today. I know sometimes it's not easy to get up there, so I appreciate that. Um, my question, I'm not really sure how this all works since I'm a new board member, but how can the board get information about what the district does offer on dual and concurrent enrollment? Okay, so then we would take that to the agenda item. Okay. And you'll do a request for information. Okay. Um, but we'll probably do a search on the library. And this is always a good thing to remind the public. We have a lot of information on a library, which is open to the public, on board docs. That is linked in the board section of the website. And you can search a topic and find out what questions the board has asked that the district has answered. And there's a lot of information in there. It's, it's pretty interesting for those of you who don't mind digging through. So, okay. so that would be the process. Um, and, and you could also ask Rob too, but in general, right. board comment is in a discussion. Okay. okay. Sounds good. Thank right. you. Okay. Um, and I look forward to learning more about CTE later in our, um, on the agenda. And then just two um, short things. One is I just want to publicly thank the staff for helping in the new board member orientations. Um, Lisa <laughs> and I have both been um, oriented the past couple weeks and it will continue next week and I know everyone's so busy so I appreciate them taking time to do that and then lastly before break I was asked to um, be a judge for the Heatherwood Elementary Spelling Bee and I just wanted to thank them for asking me to do that and it was really cute and they are so smart and I just I really enjoyed doing that thank you all right uh, who would like to go next Kitty I also want to thank everybody who came to speak, um, and, and CTE is something, as you know, we'll be discussing later. Uh, I had the opportunity to be um, part of the Spelling Bee at Emerald just before the break, and this was the second year they've invited me, and it was really fun. And, um, and I'm looking forward to doing National History Day at, um, I can't remember where I'm going, Broomfield Middle, I think. <laughs> Okay, uh, Donna? Um, I want to acknowledge, before I get to the thank yous on the speakers, the um, impact on education for giving that, uh, the grants toward our music programs. Because music, as um, I think it was Sir Ken Robinson on one of his TED Talks, talked about how if we can emphasize and um, encourage creativity, we also encourage productivity and mental health. So I was glad and want to acknowledge them for that. But also to the speakers that came on CTE, I'm, I'm totally on board with uh, CTE. I have uh, my middle son, um, hey, Zach Myers, uh, his wife is in labor at this moment and I may have to leave early because I just got a text saying, uh, we're going to the hospital and I'm supposed to pick up the little guy. So anyway, but what I want to say about CTE is my son would not have gone on to the career he did without being part of CTE. Now this was many years ago, but and you guys will know when I say Cisco networking was what he did. I, I retired after years of work in the school district, but CTE was uh, my passion uh, as far as it, it made my Zach who he is and made him love the career that he's doing. So with that said, then also our speaker on um, the enrollment, yes, we've got work to do. And, and I do think that, that, you know, when teachers are impacted and classes are overfilled, children can't learn as well. And if we're going to change that opportunity and the achievement gap, we have to address the overcrowding. Thank you. Okay, uh, Richard. 
Thank you to all the speakers that came to talk about uh, CTE. Before CTE, I think it was vocational education. I believe when I was going to school, that's what they called it. CTE was relatively new when I came on the board for me. I even had to say, what is CTE? But anyway, I find out what it is. Uh, so we are going to be hearing a presentation tonight, and I hope you stick around for that. Uh, I'm anxious to hear it. Uh, so, and I know that it is uh, an, a, a program or a process that does keep kids in school and provides them with skills that they need uh, when they graduate from high school. I've often said that many of our kids graduate from high school not ready for the labor force, not ready for the job market. Many of them are not going to college, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we know all that, and I'm hoping that once we get through this uh, presentation, we'll get more information on it. Um, I know that building trades and, and uh, uh, those programs that used to be around a long time ago, like shop in, 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 in uh, middle schools and also in high schools, those are pretty much out. I believe, and uh, uh, the only one that I think has it at this point is Broomfield High School, because uh, I went to go visit Broomfield High School, and they still have a wood shop at Broomfield High School, which is really cool. Uh, uh, so having said that, thank you very much for being here. Uh, the, um, I guess what really concerns me a lot, uh, Rob, is the report that we got from the state. Uh, and I look at the number of schools that we have, and I look at the schools that have very little graduation rates, you know, and it's the alternative of high schools that we have. Um, but we've known, we've had this, this information forever. We've known this, and, and it, it's like, wow, it's hard to, to figure out what we're trying to do or what we're doing to to increase the graduation rates of our, our students, particularly students of color and Latino kids in the district, because I think if I look, uh, and I haven't seen the report uh, in depth, but I think once we look in there and we disaggregate the data, the, the high school graduation rate for Latino kids is gonna be relatively low compared to the white graduation rates. Um, so uh, I'm hoping that with the information that we get from, this, from CDE and the information that we have here, CTE combined, uh, that we're able to do something that will provide more opportunities for our kids to be able to do better in school and stay in school and, uh, um, and reduce this, this really uh, stubborn graduation rate that we have here. Uh, and that goes along with the achievement gap. We, we also know that the achievement gap has been stubborn, I mean, in terms of trying to close it. And, uh, uh, and I'm glad for the strategic plan because I think it's, it's given us some, some um, uh, ways that we can close that achievement gap, and, and I truly appreciate that. And as we move into more um, of the nuts and bolts of the achievement of the uh, strategic plan, we'll be able to report to our communities uh, what we're doing more specifically. And the other one, too, that I'm really concerned about is the suspension rates that we have in our school system. I did an RFI on suspension rates, and I believe many of you already read the RFI, and it's pretty alarming as it relates to the Latino population versus the white population. Uh, and I also did an RFI on the uh, uh, concurrent enrollment. Uh, uh, so it's, 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 and they've reported back on that already, so if you want to get in there and look at it, you can get some more information on it. It may not be the same question that you may have, Stacy, but but you can look at what I, what I uh, requested. Uh, but I'm sure that working together, working with the community, working with CTE, working with a whole lot of other entities that we'll probably get it right, hopefully. I know we will. Thank you. Um, 
thank you to the speakers who came to talk about CTE and the emails we got. I was, uh, I was thankful back in, was it September, October, the CTE event at the JCC? Um, it, CTE isn't anything that I thought it was, and I have a, I have a lot to learn about it, but it was an amazing event. Um, I got to meet with, uh, in particular, the teachers in the departments um, of medicine and law, um, construction, and, and auto shop, and they're doing fantastic things. It was clear to me that at least part of the problem we have um, is a PR problem, that I think people don't recognize the amazing work that our CTA programs are doing or what they look like uh, in 2020. Um, and thank you also for putting on, um, on our radar some of the things that other districts are doing. I'll definitely be looking into that more and trying to get a clear picture of additional things we can be doing on top of that. I'll echo on the CTE. Um, as I look back on my last four years on the board, I don't feel like we've moved the needle very far on CTE. And I'm hoping that now as incorporating it into the strategic plan that we can see some significant movement. Um, so I'm somewhat discouraged over the history, but encouraged that we're starting to maybe put a little more attention into it. Um, and Lisa, some of our neighbor districts are doing amazing things. Um, I think St. Brain is doing an amazing job. And I look at St. Brain because they're almost the same size as us. It's hard to compare to a Cherry Creek or a um, Jeffco because they're so big, they can have the student population to drive bigger programs. But if you have a chance to go visit Warren Tech or the new Cherry Creek Technology Innovation Center, I think you'll be blown away. So, um, Is that something maybe we can, we can organize for a few yeah. of us? Because I think that would be fantastic. So, you know, thank you for bringing that to our attention. Um, my son, like yours, Donna, um, wouldn't, I don't think wouldn't have been, well, he would have graduated, but he wouldn't have had the experience that he had had it not been for CTE. Um, it gave him something to go to school for, something to be excited about, something to teach him that he could be good at something um, when he wasn't particularly good at school, traditional school. So um, I'm very passionate. And I, it's a new world out there for CT because there is, now there's certificates, and I can't even figure out how to navigate the certificates, but certificates matter for employers. And so we just have a lot to figure out and a lot to learn as we go forward and navigate this whole CTE. So, um, and then I think another place that I have felt that we really need to up our game is on internships and mentorships and partnerships. And I've talked to you, Rob, about that. So there's not much to say other than I think we have an amazing community and we don't capitalize on that amazing community in ways that we might be able to, to help our students and, and partner with the community. Um, for DAC, um, I agree when I, I did my own informal survey about a year ago at interventions we do for literacy and we have a lot of them and very few for math, like almost none, especially at the elementary level. So I think it's, thank you for bringing that to our attention because I understand that literacy is kind of foundational, but so is math. <laughs> um, being someone who was a terrible math student, I often wonder if I'd had the kind of math interventions I'm hoping to see that I might actually have been able to get through algebra a little better than I did. So thank you for bringing that to our attention. And then finally, I just um, want to say thank you to um, Speaker Casey Becker for including us in opening day ceremonies and getting to hear um, all the amazing things that are coming up on the agenda for the legislature. It's going to be an um, interesting session. There's a lot coming at us um, on the education platform. And so I think um, we as a board have done a really good job of following that and staying engaged, and so I'm just very thankful to have had an opportunity to go and to hear kind of what's on the landscape going forward. And um, it was just really fun to, to be there and feel the energy in the room. And so I just wanted to do a shout out to her for thank you, for including us and, um, and putting a hand out so that we have a better partnership going forward on some of those issues. All right, and thanks to the speakers. I'm looking forward to our presentation that's coming up next. I also just want to appreciate Dak and Rob for sharing your data with such transparency and honesty. That's incredibly important to me that we recognize our warts and then go after them. So um, thank you both entities for doing that. It's always a good reminder and to keep us grounded in our work. Um, okay, so our next item is the um, CTE update.
Good evening, President Marcos, members of the board, Dr. Anderson. Uh, super glad to be here. Talk about um, following the lead of great comments as we go through our CTE update. We, um, I'm gonna introduce here in just one quick second, Dr. Arlie Huffman, he is our CTE director. I wanna share a little bit about what the CTE report will look like this evening. You all have made excellent comments around where we're going and what that needs to look like and what um, the future holds for us. So if you think about CTE, we often think about 21st century skills, which actually now are called modern instruction, modern teaching. Um, most of that work is uh, we're into the, into the century almost a quarter already. Part of our conversation is that as we look over the last 10 years, CTE has been nationally a, conversa a national conversation, and more importantly for BVSD, a regional conversation. And many of your comments were absolutely right that although we have the best kept secret in many areas, there's so much more that we can do to grow, and we're excited tonight to share with you some of those conversations as we look forward. Thank you, Dr. Crespo. Um, uh, members of the board and Dr. Anderson, uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, inviting me to come in this evening and, and share with you uh, where we are and where we can go. Um, as, uh, as we've heard already, uh, there's a lot of interest around CTE. Um, so I'm going to start this evening about uh, to make a couple of uh, rather bold statements, if I will, that could frame uh, the, rest of the, the rest of the presentation. Um, number one, CTE is uh, a benefit and an advantage to every student. 100% can, can benefit from this. Um, and as you've heard, uh, BV, in BVSD, we're behind. We're far, far behind. Um, and we have, uh, we have a long way to go. Uh, but as you'll see through the, through the presentation, we, uh, we've started the plan on, uh, on how to move forward. And uh, I, I think our, uh, at the end of our, uh, of our setup uh, through the strategic plan, we're, we're going to be in, in a very good place. Um, so as, uh, as you know, um, our world is changing very rapidly. And this is one example, this short video about um, automation. And we hear about automation all the time and, and how it's actually taking jobs away. Well, our, one of our uh, challenges with that is what, do, what are we doing with our students? Um, we don't want to be preparing our students for those jobs that are going to be going away. We want to be preparing our students to create these systems. This is the way that the world is, is moving. We're not going to be changing that. So that, that's part of what we want to do. But to do that, we have to change ourselves. We really have to investigate what are we doing in our system? How can we be moving forward and not thinking in arrears? I love this example. I'm an old computer science teacher. Um, and you might recognize one of these, the old Mac 2. In fact, you might even be able to hear it boot up um, somewhere back in your, in your mind. And what could we do with that? And that was 25, 27 years ago. Um, you could do word processing, spreadsheets, a few games. It was the best thing you ever saw. Well, in our pockets right now, probably everybody in this room, we have something like the iPhone 11 Pro, and it'll do everything. You can connect with anybody in the world and find out just about any piece of information that's out there. Now, this is pretty quick, 27 years, but I want to put one other, num uh, one other number to this. If you think about pure processing power, just to tell you how quickly this is happening, it would take, to match the, the processing power in an iPhone 11 Pro, it would take 30,000 Mac 2s, 30,000, 27 years. This is quick, quick change. So one of the other big areas that we see, and we might even have experienced this already, is in the world of medicine. We have telemedicine, we have robotic surgery, we have things that, uh, where our artificial intelligence is being uh, more accurate than uh, even, even the humans are right now in, in identifying things. Our, again, our world, we are in, in, um, experiencing that all the time, constantly. So what does that mean about our world? Well, it's changing radically, as we might know, and we see all the time. We need our students to be prepared for that. We have, to be, we have to be setting them uh, forward out of our doors, enabled to deal with that kind of radical change. It's only going to speed up. They need, they need the tools to be able to do this. So where are we right now? As we heard, CT exists in, in BVSD. This isn't anything new to our district. But it's not this. 
Um, we uh, often, when you go out and you talk about voc ed, uh, people have the old, uh, the old model. I think probably here they're maybe learning how to make toast. Uh, maybe they've had a conversation about which pearls to wear. Um, those old home ec uh, classes don't exist. That is not, and we know that in this room, we probably know that. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the community doesn't know that. Those classes are preparing our students for the past. We need to uh, prepare them for their future. The things that we haven't even thought about yet, they have to be ready to, to, uh, to be successful in. So it really is for every student. We shouldn't be seeing any, any school anywhere in our district that doesn't offer a wide variety of opportunities for, for, for each student. It should be just part of the standard operating procedure as we, as we look around our district. The experience gets you farther. We all know that, 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 that desire to learn, when, you're, when it's hands-on, um, this, is, this is more engaging. Um, it also will allow our students to try things out. Uh, they should have, have an opportunity while they're with us to, to do a variety of things, decide what they like, what they don't like. They can earn, uh, I'm sorry, learn skills that will enable them to earn a living right out of high school, while they're working through college, beyond all of the above. Why are our students choosing CTE right now? They love the practical experience. They don't have to wait until college to find out about something, uh, better career. Um, that top left comment, something that they're passionate about. I would invite you, um, if you haven't had the opportunity, to have a conversation with students in the CTE programs. The passion for learning, what they're learning, is palpable. It's exciting. It's something that you don't hear very often, and honestly, um, when you talk to a 16-year-old that has that passion for learning and can explain it in a very, very mature way, it might change uh, perceptions just about what high school students are all about. Little snapshot in this, in this graph about where we are in the district right now. The career cl clusters down the left side. And you see we have a couple of different areas that have a relatively high enrollment. Total CT enrollment across the district is about 4,500 uh, students in high school. Many of those students only take one semester's worth of CTE class. Um, so they're not getting an in-depth uh, experience, level of experience. But the other thing I'd, uh, I'd, I'd draw your eye to is looking down the graph a little bit at some of the areas that, uh, that we are not having high enrollment in, such as health science, um, advanced manufacturing, even STEM, we don't have excuse me, don't have great enrollment in. Um, but when you look across the board, again, we have CTE in every one of our high schools in, in some various form. Uh, but things, as we started to look at this, you see uh, a, a glaring hole, and that's in the bottom center in the health science and public safety. The only programs out there are at Boulder Tech right now. And Boulder Tech is, that's, that's difficult for some students to, uh, to reach and to, and to get to. And speaking of Boulder Tech, it really is BVSD's best kept secret, and that's a bad thing. We have to change that. And it goes back to that perception. Um, we, we still are living in the age where it's for, the perception is that students are underachieving can do this, lack the ability to go to higher, any, uh, any type of higher ed. Specifically in BVSD, Boulder Tech has some unique challenges. Uh, it has an association with Arapahoe Ridge High School since it shares the building. Um, lack of awareness out there, even within district and district employees, and the assumption is that it's only for students that don't want to go on to college or don't do well in their, in their standard classes. The CTE teachers at Boulder Tech um, are industry experts. They undergo training uh, to be able to bring industry standard materials, experiences, Going out into the community, this is part of the, uh, the construction trades at, at Boulder Tech where they work with Habitat for Humanity across uh, Boulder County. And the uh, annual, uh, let the music come down a little bit. This is, this is the, uh, the, at the art show at the Dairy Center each spring uh, where the cosmetology students get to show off in a very creative ways what they've learned and that they really are prepared to go out into industry. 
in my class, kids are amplifying their own DNA and see, oh, wow, my phenotype does match my genotype. That's, it's so much more relevant than just reading that in a book. It's all about hands-on. And we, when we hear, and, and poor Christy, I'll apologize to her later. Um, uh, when we hear about uh, uh, project-based learning and how exciting that is for students, it's, it's all hands-on in CTE. It is truly project-based learning taken to the, to the ultimate level. One of the ways that our students are demonstrating this, and, and it was mentioned earlier, is with our industry certificates. Um, we have a, a, a large number, and this, this is from, uh, this pictures are from Auto Collision. Well, last year, we had 210 students across the district earn industry certificates through a state program that brought $210,000 back directly to the CTE programs where the students earned the certificates. So 210 students is great. We could have a lot more. We could triple that in, in a couple, three years uh, with, with some concerted effort. So we are changing to meet that future need. So I want to explain what we're doing and what we have set in place. So it, we are rooting this in the strategic plan. When you look at, um, look at our long-term outcomes at the top, uh, CTE really connects well with the first one and the third one, all students benefiting from challenging and relevant educational experiences, every student graduating empowered with the skills necessary for postgraduate success. If we're truly doing this so that we're meeting all students, then we, we will address the second, uh, second long-term outcome, reducing the disparities in achievement. Most of the work going on right now is in Objective 5 and in, in 5A, establishing the system that is ongoing um, work. What we are going to start doing is work on Initiative 5B. Um, and as you can see in the timeline, we're going to start that right away. That will uh, cre uh, allow us to create those learning pathways for students in a broad spectrum of careers. We're not going to limit this to one or two things. We want to, we want to make sure we're meeting the, the interests of all of our students and meeting the needs of our business members in the community. Each student should be able to graduate with the knowledge to make the well-informed decisions about their future. To do that, they need, uh, they need the hands-on experience from elementary through middle into high school. They need work-based learning experiences, such as job shadowing, externships, internships, leading to apprenticeships, post-secondary. We need to put all those together into those learning pathways for our students. Our plan is to, as I said, start that now, work through that, um, the initial steps of that this semester with the, with the goal of implementing our first pathways this coming fall. So we want, to, we want to accelerate this. We need to accelerate this for our students. So to that end, we have, uh, this is again my, uh, I'm a year and a half into this job in BVSD, and we looked back through what had happened over the last four, four plus years. Um, and from that information, we created a white paper. That white paper has helped us develop the, the broad structure to uh, a roadmap of where we want to go. So that's our current state, which I've explained to you a little bit. We want to move forward in this new direction. Initiative 5B will give us, uh, give us the tool and give us the connection to our strategic plan to be able to do this. It does take everybody. We heard that already tonight. It has to be our parent community. It has to be our business community, our teachers to meet the needs of our students. And we need to be asking our students what they want to learn as well. It has to be everybody so that we can support, we can create the structures, we can create the systems that will allow our students to reach new heights and soar beyond where they've gone before. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you so much. Uh, that was a great presentation. Um, okay, questions or comments? Who'd like to start? Stacy. Thank you. As a new board member, I didn't know a lot about the CTE program, but I do have a couple questions. Um, one is, with the new graduation guidelines, it would seem to me that there would have been a bump in some CTE um, enrollment. Did, did you see that? Is that, it, it seems to me it would fit with the new graduation guidelines. 
five. Do you want to address the guidelines first? So I'll start with the grad line, guidelines first, and then um, Arlie can come back in. So the grad guidelines are implemented 2021. Um, as that launch is occurring, we see interest. We see um, alignment, but haven't seen the bump that you're talking about yet. We will. Uh, we predict that we will see that just based on interest only and the awareness. One of the benefits of the grad guideline piece is that we are able to, as Arlie mentioned, really market, really chase down, and really uh, talk to families and students about what their options are, where maybe we didn't do that before because of a very traditional system that we had. Yeah. Okay. And, and CTE does have a direct uh, connection with concurrent enrollment, which you see in the in the graduation guidelines, uh, with the industry certificates, which, which you talked about a little bit. So as as, as awareness grows, we should be able to uh, we we should be seeing a, an increase uh, from that that perspective. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, also, how well versed are high school counselors in these uh, subjects? I, I was disturbed about an email that the board received about um, a parent who's child went to their counselor and asked about um, CTE programs and they were pushed into IB. Um, and it, it shouldn't be one or the other. It, it seems to me like this should all be one comprehensive offering that BVSD has. So I'm wondering how well versed the counselors are. It is, it is challenging. Um, it's an ongoing education that, that we have. Uh, we do, uh, Every, every year, we, at, from Boulder Tech perspective, the, the counselors are invited up to Boulder Tech to have the conversation about that, what that might look like. Um, it's, um, it should be, as you're, as you're saying, a, a, a both and. I mean, it, it's not exclusive. It's, it is a benefit, and it can, each can support each other. Um, it's the, the, the plans that we're, we're thinking of developing and hoping to, to create here in short order should help demonstrate that. Um, and make that you know, visible um, and very obvious for anybody that's looking at that from the, from the students to the, to the counselors. Over the last six months, we've been meeting with counselors on a more, all, not just counselors, grad specialists, counselors, registrars, on a more consistent basis to provide a better level of understanding around programs throughout the district, not simply related to CTE, but even across high schools. Uh, and that work is ongoing and very honestly related directly to graduation guidelines and the need to get the word out. One of the things that I want to just take a second to celebrate is our communication department. They did a really incredible job uh, developing a video because we recognize that it is the best kept secret, as well as not having the marketing materials that we needed and they just stepped up and did an incredible job it's a wonderful video highly recommend that you watch it and very honestly a lot of the pieces that you saw tonight came from that video and those are our kids so we know that getting the word out there they recognize each other and we'll able we're able to launch that way thank you yeah thank you for the presentation as i mentioned before one of my sons who was in the cte program would not have gone on to get his phd and uh, computer science and applied math had it not been for CTE because he hated school he was in special ed he couldn't read at fifth grade and started carrying around encyclopedias to show but when he went to CTE he um, at that time it was called a, a little different but he was embarrassed to go he, he snuck out of uh, cla at Fairview drove over and didn't even go to pick up his award for uh, that because he was embarrassed. How do we promote? I promote to parents like this doesn't mean that the student's not college bound. And and my question is maybe bringing in graduates from from the program to to talk to parents at whether it's uh, back to school night. But how? What are other ways to promote in our community besides the counselors? I liked it. Stacy mentioned that to promote what CTE can do for a student's career? I would say that we need everybody's help because the reality is that there are lots of um, adults in the system, throughout the system, that really feel that way as well. Um, and, and communicating and educating and processing as often as possible is how we're going to get the word out. Because very similar to what the traditional looks like, we got there because that's what was expected. And as we look to the technology and the careers and the availability for students, and you think about how many careers they're going to have in a lifetime, they need all of the skills that we're able to give them through the CTE. So definitely word of mouth, concerted effort around marketing, and I know that Arlie has tons more ideas. <laughs> well, <laughs> Mike Rowe is fantastic. Yes, that's right. We need to bring him in, perhaps. Um, and, and I'd also say, um, 
you know, we've been our own worst enemy around some of this, right? This has not been a priority in our school district. It doesn't have the funding, the focus. And so we're doing a 180. I mean, when we think about, and, and as a reminder to the public and to the board, our strategic plan was not something, a bunch of ideas that folks in central office came up with. This was, in, we, we got over 2,000 stakeholders who shared with us what they felt was important. And we developed this plan around this. So the community does feel like CTE is important. I could tell you my conversations with the chamber, right, um, and, and other folks with it, within our business community. Um, we have some work to do to, to re-establish our position around the importance of career technical education and then put our money where, where our mouth is. You will see when we bring our budget forward, um, our preliminary budget investments in CTE, you will see programmatic changes. Um, and so we have a ways to go. Uh, I, I think uh, that um, um, I, the, the, the fact that we couldn't even wait six months to fast forward this work and starting um, Strategic Initiative 5B um, starting in January signals that, hopefully that signals that to you, to our community. There is so much opportunity here. And we're behind, but we won't be behind for long. Um, you will see a concerted effort from our team. Arlie has been here a year and a half. He's, his hands are bruised because he's been sitting on them for so long um, um, trying to get this going. We need to give him the support, the resources, um, that, that he needs. We need to be investing in our schools. I'm so excited about the potential. I am discouraged where we're at today, though. And, and I would be lying to you to tell you that I'm pleased with where we are because we have so much more we can do. Um, but um, it's not just getting people engaged. It's retelling our story, right? That when you want to create relevant opportunities for kids that are rigorous, right, to think about the world of work tomorrow that it looks nothing like the world of work today will look like. Um, and that Daniel Pink quote is so powerful because oftentimes as adults we think about preparing kids for our past, not their future. And their future is very, very different. So um, I, I just shared that we haven't helped ourselves. Um, and as, as, we're, as we're going out, we need to be forceful as we go out into our community with our counselors, with our schools, that this is a priority, this is important. Um, and it's going to take all of us working together to do that. Okay, next, Lisa. Uh, thank you so much. Looking at those uh, enrollment numbers for medicine and uh, the legal programs, my understanding is that the interest is much greater than enrollment, but between the length of the programs and the transport to and from, it's difficult to integrate uh, with schedules for students who might be interested. So I guess I'm wondering first if that's an accurate understanding, and secondly, if it is, what sorts of solutions um, would be your, your ideal solutions? So it's, yes, it's, it's accurate in that it, it only exists right now at, at Boulder Tech. Um, so it, that, that presents a hurdle just in and of itself. Uh, you know, transportation, getting there, scheduling, et cetera, is, is tough. Um, one, of the, one of the things that that brings to light that would help uh, address that um, is that it shouldn't only be at, at Boulder Tech. Uh, something like healthcare, while we might not ever be able to implement you know, full-blown uh, medical programs at every, every single high school, we could certainly have introduction to healthcare and some uh, some uh, programs that have uh, clinical hours, the, any of the allied health programs. We could implement those um, uh, across the, the district so that students would have access in their schools. And the if we, if we set up the, the pathways the right way, it would be beneficial for them to have access to that in ninth and 10th grade so they can look at Boulder Tech and getting really in depth in 11th, 12th, and then connection to the to post-secondary. So it, it's, a, it's a multifaceted challenge that we, that we face with regard to that. Um, but, but to your point, uh, if we have anything that only exists at Boulder Tech, we will always have those challenges of transportation and, and scheduling at the home high schools. One of the things I just want to share that I, to answer your question related to obstacles and how swiftly and quickly can we move them. Just this week we had a conversation around a misconception around how many classes a student could take at Tech and had to take at their high school. 
And it was just that, a misconception. So right now we're drafting a uh, conversation, communication to go out to say, no, this is what it is, so that we can facilitate the opportunity for students to access tech in a much cleaner and systematic way that doesn't seem different at different high schools, doesn't have different opportunities. Uh, and it's a huge barrier right now. Once we realized how large it was and that actually was just a communication clear up, it, it will become clear how much more access they have. Kathy? First, I want to say I love that last graphic, the one before questions. I don't, I don't remember seeing that before, but it's, a, it's that's that great. It kind of sums up what we're You're working. unveiling it right now. It's, <laughs> it's awesome. We need to <laughs> wear that one proudly. Um, when I toured the Cherry Creek Innovation Center, because they have a block schedule, they were actually able to get, with transportation, kids that were doing IB and having access to the tech center. So I think since we already have at least a modified block, I'm just wondering what kinds of schedule changes, I'm sure you're looking at that, to be able to have the accessibility, because I think um, that, as you said, is one of the barriers, but some of our neighboring districts have been able to figure out how to do that around changing the block schedule so that kids can come and still take their, their classes at the high school. So. I don't know that that's a question, but something I'm sure you're looking at. Um, what kind of partnerships do we have for CTE with our charters? Do they have the same access? Do we, are we working with them? How, are, how is that working? They definitely have uh, access to Boulder Tech. Um, what, they, uh, what they don't have uh, is, is transportation directly from those schools to Boulder Tech. Uh, but but it, is, it is open to that, uh, Boulder Tech has uh, I don't have the exact number in front of me, but a, a fair number of, of students that are enrolled in the programs right now from, from the charters. Um, it's, uh, it is a little more difficult, uh, mainly because of scheduling. Um, honestly, the, they uh, might have a different schedule than the, than the high school does uh, that's down the street. Um, so that, that is one challenge, but we do, we do have uh, I would think for those charters that are serving, especially our struggling, struggling populations, if we can figure out how to reach those students maybe a little earlier on and kind of figure out those transportation issues, that might be a really um, beneficial partnership. Um, I was wondering, Rob, I know that there's, um, and you mentioned it a little bit early in your presentation, there's unique funding circumstances around CTE, and I'm wondering if at some point we could just get a brief update, because I know there's reimbursement from the federal government for facilities, there's the reimbursement on the certificate programs. So some of these programs, as you suggested, help pay for themselves. It might help us expand within our limited budget, so maybe we could get just when we sometime a budget update, I could do an RFI on that too, just so we have a better understanding of where the financial benefits are of offering increased CTE programs. Um, and then do you, I know you're working on the first pathway. Do you have, can you give us a preview? Do we know what it's going to be? Or is this a, another one of BVSD's best kept secrets or it hasn't been developed? <laughs> Honestly, it hasn't been developed yet. Um, we, when, uh, as, as uh, Dr. Anderson mentioned, you know, working closely with the chamber to identify the biggest area of, areas of need um, in our business community is a good place to start. Um, the, the stakeholder meetings, the input that we will uh, start to undertake will help us define exactly where we want to go with that. I just want to say thank you, Arlie, because I know we've had you sit on your hands, as Dr. Anderson said, and it's really exciting to think that, that maybe now we're going to be able to use your full potential and move forward on this, because I do think we've had this theory that we don't have those kids in Boulder, and um, there's so many opportunities there, and so I just want to thank both of you for bringing this forward, and I really look forward to the next presentation and see how far we've moved it, and thanks, Margaret, too, for supporting all this, so thank you. I had a couple questions. One is catering at the high schools part of career tech? Yes, it is. Okay, and because I'll just make a comment. So many kids take that class, mm -hmm. and I think part of it is because it's in the high school. Mm -hmm. And I'll be curious to see how many kids take the follow-up catering too at the kitchen, which is also really exciting. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do hope we keep thinking about putting things in high schools. We are spread over 500 square miles, which makes it incredibly unique. and. Um, I also think it's nice when a kid does not have to travel and spend gas and <clears throat> blow up their carbon footprint and all that, which I think is important too. Um, the other question I have is, I understand that career tech is available for students in private schools. Um, how does that relationship work and do we get money from the state in that situation? 
So I would defer to how BVSD does it with um, to bill specifically around that funding. But yes, there is a system for reimbursing private school students similar to some of the other title funds that we do um, access because they count within our system for our accounts for CTE state. So I'll just leave that there and let him if there are further questions. Okay, so I'll do an RFI. Yeah, we, yeah, we can get back to you on that. All right, any other questions? Tina? Yes. Where's the video? How do we uh, access it? It's, a, it's on the enrollment. So we'll, I'll get, send a link so that you have it. Uh, I just want to say, I know you're ending, I just want to say thank you to Jade, he's the reason we have that beautiful graphic. I want to say thank you to Madeline Brockish, who's here to support us tonight. We would not be able to do concurrent or CTE without her and Arlie. Okay, thank you. Kitty found the video. Your Academy Award speech will play you off. The Oscars, right? <laughs> All right, thanks so much. Uh, we have another item, it's the legislative update, and unless people need to take a break now. Okay, we're going to take a break now. And we'll be back in five minutes. All right, thanks for coming back, those of you who did. Our next <laughs> <laughs> item is the legislative update. So the legislative session kicked off last uh, Wednesday. Was it Wednesday? And, um, and it's always um, for the new board members, we uh, we will give our input on certain bills. Generally, that goes through Rob. And it also goes through our two lobbyists, Tanya and Ernestine. And then, um, and I don't know to what extent you've been consulted on all the bills that have been thrown out there on either side, but um, you know, to the extent that you can give us an update on what you're hearing from your peers and, um, and anyone else who's down there, Kathy or Kitty or whoever's out um, down in the Capitol. Just tell us what you're hearing and what you're experiencing. Absolutely. Um, a lot of education bills were dropped uh, within the first week. Um, our team will be looking. Um, we have a standing agenda item on our cabinet meetings to go through all of the priority and non-priority bills that are part of the bill tracker that Tanya and Ernestine has set up for us. I believe you all have access to. If not, I'll make sure you, you have that. Um, so we decide whether we're taking what type of position we want to take. Um, as always, we use the legislative platform to really guide our initial um, response to those on behalf of the district. And if there's if there's things that need um, deeper um, consultation information, uh, you know, we'll be reaching out to board members on that. Um, but lots of stuff going on. It's early on. You know how these things kind of twist and turn and change. Um, but uh, but uh, we'll be having a, a deeper discussion tomorrow on, on everything that's that's out there today. Um, and uh, we have a superintendent's meeting, um, a state superintendent's meeting next week, and I'll get the scoop at that meeting on kind of the things that are cooking and can, can, can report back. And, and just one of the perpetual challenges is the bills move faster and are amended faster than our board meets. So sometimes it's tricky because when you have 50 education bills in play and you're wondering what, how it's going to impact you, you don't even know how it's going to be amended. And we may not even be meeting for two weeks. And we probably won't call emergency meetings to discuss bills that haven't gone through enough. So that it's, it's always this imbalance of when we get information and to what extent the board can weigh in. That's why the legislative platform is actually quite important because that gives the district and our lobbyists what they need to go after a bill. So they don't need to come to us if that bill is clearly being addressed by our legislative platform. All right. Uh, Kathy, do you have any comments? A few. Um, some of the bills that I've heard of, there's a um, CEA is going to drop a bill that uses money from the um, state trust lands for a salary pool so that everybody gets up to $40,000 starting salary plus COLA. And what was interesting to me is that even with our high starting salary, because we have such a high cost of living, we would qualify. The only district they said, that, not that we should, <laughs> it's a grant program which is always um, a challenge to have a grant program for salaries. But anyway, um, Westminster was the only district that didn't qualify, which I thought was really interesting. So we'll see how that goes. I think um, the talking point around it that I found interesting was when we've seen ballot measures in the past go down, people say, well, we don't know how you're going to, you're not going to spend it on teachers, because we could never say that. It was just going to go into a general fund. If this passes, there'll be an actual place where you could say this money will go into this pot of money that can only be used for teacher salaries. So that was the best talking point I heard around that, so we'll see what happens with that. 
Um, there's a potential for a requirement for teacher training on mental health, and when you add that in with the culturally responsive requirements, all of a sudden, all of your hours are spoken for, which kind of flies in the face of 191, which is supposed to allow you to take training in areas that you need help with, and all of a sudden, all those hours are going to be spoken for, so we're going to see what happens with that. Um, a couple other things. One of the interesting things I heard just in passing is, I'm, and I'm actually hoping this passes, is that there could be a bill to limit the campaign contributions in school board races. Um, and for those of you who don't know, we're the only entity that doesn't have campaign contribution limits. Um, and I think it's high time that we have, I mean, I know there's a hundred ways around it, but at least we can have the conversation. And if you saw the kinds of money that went into the Denver school board race, it was stunning to me. Um, and you're a little sensitive about that. Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I just think it's good policy. Um, so, and then two others, one, a couple other things. We don't know where we're going to be on the uniform mill levy. Um, we don't know if it's going to be a JVC bill. There's still talk around it. Um, that might be one we might want to, if we had to have a meeting about, we might want to talk about that because it has such a potentially direct impact on us and might solve some short-term funding problems. Who knows? Um, and then two things coming up. Apparently St. Vrain, and Randy's not here, but apparently St. Vrain's going to have some education day on March 11th. Um, and so they want, at the, at the legislature, and they want everyone to come. I don't know a whole lot more about it. Um, it's St. Vrain, so <laughs> we're trying to find out more about it, so I've asked. So I just tell you that that's coming up. And then there's the teacher day, which is March 18th, and they're going to be looking for support from districts and administrators to support. It's kind of a day of support for teachers where I think everybody's supposed to go to the Capitol again. So we have those two dates coming up to look forward to, to rally around the great cause of education. So um, what I about think, our CASB region day? Well, I, I was going to ask if um, we haven't done this in the past. But I had a request to figure out if there's a way to, um, they have student days at the Capitol. So I don't know, we've never done that, and maybe it's too hard to do. Yes, we have, with CASB. But not for a while. Yeah. So I'm wondering if it's too late. One of them's already spoken, but I don't know if we could try to organize a student day at the Capitol or not. Um, so I'm just putting that out there as a request to see if it's something oh. we could. I was referring to our region. So CASB hosts different days at the mm -hmm. Capitol for the regions mm -hmm. for the board members. Right. Yeah. And so we can put that date out there again. It's coming up. Um, it's actually a real, aside from being able to go down and go to the Capitol, it's a nice time to, co to collaborate with other members that you might not see otherwise. So, and then there's the CASB Winter Conference coming up the end of February, which I think you pointed out we also had overlapping with our our bond tour, which I think we fixed now. Thank so you for pointing that out. Laura and I are on it. We um, decided to put all the CASB dates in the calendar for this year and next year. So those are going to be appearing on your calendars um, so that we don't have conflicts. And also for the um, NSBA conference in April. Uh, and then I think we should probably throw on that regional day, Laura, if we figure out where it is. All right. that's a, thank you for doing that. I think that's a great idea. And that way we'll be able to plan around it in case those are important to us. Thank you. All that's right. all I have. Awesome. Thank you. Yes. Now, one bill that's being introduced I just want to comment on because I'm really happy this is being introduced is making it a crime for an educator to have sex with a student who is legally an adult because our child sexual abuse laws cover everybody 17 and under, under, but we have 18 and 19 year olds in high school and they can think they're in love with their teacher and engage in a sexual relationship, which is, you know, completely inappropriate. So I'm, I really hope this passes and that this can be made illegal. Thank you. All right. Um, so our next item, if no one has any other comments, I'd move on to action items. Number eight action items, consent grouping. I'm going to read them off. 8.1, personnel items. 8.2, approval of minutes, December 10th, 2019, special meeting. 8.3, approval of minutes, December 10th, 2019, regular meeting. 8.4, approval of minutes, December 17th, 2019, special meeting. 8.5, 2020, BVSD legislative platform. 8.6, acceptance of donation, Bear Creek Elementary. 8.7, acceptance of donation, Centennial Middle School. 8.8, .8, acceptance of donation, Fairview High School. 
8.9, acceptance of donation Fireside Elementary. 8.10, acceptance of donation Food Services. 8.11, acceptance of donation Foothill Elementary. 8.12, uh, acceptance of donation Louisville Elementary. 8.13, acceptance of donation STEM Program. 8.14, Alicia Sanchez Elementary Priority Improvement Plan. 8.15, approval of the architectural design and engineering ad services change order for bond funded improvement work at University Hill Elementary School. 8.16, approval of the consultant agreement to update the district's educational specifications. 8.17, approval of the contract for professional services to conduct inventory and barcoding of facility equipment district wide. 8.18, close out to the construction manager general contractor contract for bond funded work at the Coal Creek Elementary School. 8.19, close out to the construction manager general contractor contract for bond funded work at the Nettle and Bus Facility. 8.20, close out to the construction manager general contractor contract for bond funded work at Nettleland Elementary School. 8.21, close out to the construction manager general contractor contract for bond funded work at Nettleland Middle High School. 8.22, resolution 20.01 regarding notice of meetings for the Board of Education. All right, um, first we have, uh, does anyone want to pull any items? Okay, would anyone like a motion to approve these items by Kathy, seconded by Kitty? Okay, any discussion or questions? Kathy? Two questions. One, I should know the answer to this. Do we just have to do 8.22 every year, Kathleen? Or are we out of compliance? Yes. Yes, no, we're, we're exactly where we should be. It's just the first board meeting of the calendar year. That we have to say, that's what I thought. I remember yeah. doing this before. Mm -hmm. And then, um, Rob, I just had a question about the ed specs. Um, I went and read the policy. Apparently, you've told us about this before. Could you refresh my memory on just briefly what, what we're doing? It seems like it makes a whole lot of sense, and we're planning ahead and all of that, but I just wanted some confirmation about what that's about. Sure, and, and I'll ask Rob to come up in case I, I get anything wrong or, or missing any information. Um, as we think about um, board policy FEA, uh, making sure that we have uh, updated ed specifications. Um, it's We haven't um, gone and reset our ed specs in I think it's 10 years. Um, and so we feel like it's time to do that. And then once you have qualified ed specifications, um, it will allow Rob and his team to do a thorough facility assessment, not just for condition of facility, but also for the educational uses of our facilities. So as we think about future, um, future investments that we need in the future of our facilities program, we'll be in good shape. What's the timing? When would we expect to get the results from that? Um, we look to have that wrapped up. We're getting a little bit of a late start. Um, I'm going to guess we'll have that wrapped up by October time frame. We'll have several community meetings, et cetera, part of that process. You'll have community meetings after the report, so... It, during the okay. process to create the ed specs. Oh, awesome. So okay. we'll put together a timeline for the board, and we'll share that with you. Thanks. Yep. It's exciting. All right. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Laura, would you please call the roll? Garcia. Yes. Gebhardt. Yes. Marquis. Yes. Myers. Myers is not present. Sargent. Yes. Sweeney Moran. Yes. Ziss. Yes. Motion passes. Okay, our next item is action item 9.1, resolution 1938, in support of a voter registration awareness week in DVSD high schools. Uh, if you recall, before we went on break, we talked about this um, resolution, which was uh, meant, it describes it here, meant to be a show of BVSD support and awareness regarding the importance of youth voter registration. Um, and I just, uh, we just decided to put it on action to draw awareness of it because we think this is an important way that the uh, school district can support the Boulder County clerk and its efforts. Um, any questions or comments about this resolution? No? Thanks, okay. Tina, for bringing it up. Of course, yeah. Uh, voting so important. All right, Laura, would you please call the roll? Oh, need we need a motion. I move yeah. to approve resolution 19-38 in support of a voter registration awareness week in BVSD high schools. Okay, we have a second by Richard. All right, now we can call the roll. Garcia. Yes. Gephardt. Yes. Marquis. Yes. Myers is not present. Sargent. Yes. Sweeney Moran. Yes. Ziss. Yes. Motion passes. 
All right. Uh, the next item is the 2019-20 revised budget. So, Rob, who, what's going on? We'll ask Bill, uh, Bill Sutter, our CFO, to come on up and walk us through where we are with the 1920 revised budget. Bill, turn it over to you. Great. <clears throat> we need a bigger podium up here for some papers. Let's Tell see. me about it. <laughs> So uh, this is the study item for the revised budget. Uh, this is the standard process uh, for the board to uh, revise the budget based on new information uh, from what was adopted back in June. Uh, we have until, or the board has until uh, the end of January to adopt uh, a revised budget uh, based on that new information. So uh, I'll be going through the general operating fund uh, and then a little bit on the other funds uh, within the district. So for the general operating fund, uh, beginning balance revenue expenditures, transfers, reserve, and then a summary of the changes because uh, there are changes to each of those. And then on the other funds, uh, the summary of notable changes, uh, certainly every fund has a little bit of uh, adjustments to it, uh, but those are not, while they're in the uh, attachments, uh, I'm not going through those uh, in detail. So for the beginning balance uh, on the general operating fund, uh, we have an increase uh, in the uh, funds available uh, in the beginning, uh, beginning balance. So unspent budgets, so these are standard carryover items and special carryover items. I'll go, in those, uh, go into those in more detail later. Uh, and then just the variance from what was adopted, uh, so an additional 4.6 million uh, available. On the revenue side, uh, things get a little more interesting. So uh, we had fewer students uh, than we did last year, so uh, full on decline in enrollment, about 220 students. Uh, from last year, uh, so that uh, reduces our per pupil revenue uh, and the commensurate override uh, that goes with that. We have some one-time revenue adjustments uh, for our abatements and specific ownership tax. So uh, we were a little short in our property tax collections last year as people file, uh, 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 contest their property taxes, we collect a little less. Uh, we make that up in the following year uh, with an abatement. Uh, we count that as a one-time revenue. It's really just a shift in the timing of when it's collected. And then for specific ownership tax, uh, those are car registrations. There's two components of specific ownership tax, uh, the equalized and non-equalized. Equalized is a component of the School Finance Act uh, and per-pupil revenue. The uh, non-equalized is just the component that the uh, district gets to keep. And uh, as uh, it's, it's uh, moved from, essentially moved from non-equalized into equalized in the following year, uh, as the state readjusts uh, the amount that we're collecting, it's uh, calculated in arrears uh, for what the component for uh, equalized uh, that's built in the School Finance Act. And then some other uh, changes to categorical reimbursements, uh, interest, and the READ Act. On the expenditure side, uh, the carryover items, so these standard carryover items, textbooks, uh, Medicaid funding, uh, school resource allocation, uh, and the Board of Education uh, allotment for uh, travel and meetings. Um, most of the uh, standard carryover. It's about 2.2 million in textbooks, 1.6 in Medicaid, and 700,000 in the school resource allocation. So that's the lion's share of that. Uh, for special carryover items, uh, those are uh, unspent budgets uh, and projects that weren't completed uh, in last year. And then for the one-time funding requests, uh, these were uh, just items that came along uh, as needs for the district. Uh, the lion's share of that is elementary literacy materials uh, and some resources for uh, the learning networks. Moving into the ongoing, the adjustments and the ongoing expenditures. Uh, so because we had fewer students counted, uh, we have fewer uh, ongoing resources in staffing. So those were moved from the ongoing staffing into the one-time staffing reserve. 
the mid-year compensation adjustment, so this is an adjustment that we made uh, to true up the budget uh, in looking at uh, the average staff costs that were built into the budget versus the average staff cost of what is currently in the system. Uh, we can make this adjustment uh, without uh, impacting the bottom line at the end of the year. Uh, this next line, this revenue offset, so there are some reductions in revenue uh, and we had uh, commensurate uh, reductions in expenditures, so that was just an offset. Uh, so total in the, on or subtotal in the ongoing, two and a half million reduction there. Uh, and then total expenditure changes, 4.1 million. Transfers, uh, so these transfers to the capital reserve fund, transportation fund, charter fund, uh, and then other funds um, are all, with the exception of the preschool item, uh, they're all one-time uses of funds. So these are one-time transfers, not ongoing items. So in the cap reserve fund uh, transfer for emergencies uh, to put funding into cap reserve. And then the portable classroom is the classroom at Ryan. Uh, interim bus routes, uh, so this is uh, largely uh, for Monarch K-8 for late start and for Pioneer to Manhattan uh, for their dual language program. Uh, charter fund we true up every year based on the October count and the prior year uh, ending expenditures. Uh, and then uh, some small adjustments for the technology and food services funds. In reserves, uh, so we increase our reserves based on those new expenditures. Uh, the Tabor Reserve, which is 3% of uh, net new expenditures, and the Contingency Reserve of 4% of net new expenditures. So this slide just summarizes uh, all the changes, the bottom line being we're adding a little bit more uh, to fund balance uh, in our budgeted fund balance, uh, just to hedge as we go into the future uh, with um, uh, declining enrollment really looking like a, a real thing. For other funds, uh, so these notable changes, again, most of these I touched on. Cap reserve, uh, that transfer for emergencies and the modular. Uh, preschool funds, so we had a increase in the CPP students that were funded and a reduction in the tuition students, uh, so we're not collecting as much tuition there. Uh, food service funds, so this is a employee retention uh, pilot one-time uh, expense uh, going into the food service fund. Uh, transportation, that interim busing. So these last th uh, three are uh, new, uh, generally accepted accounting principle requirements for student activity fund, private pur purpose trust fund, which is uh, essentially scholarship funds that we have, uh, and the para on behalf fund. So we touched on that in the audit uh, back in December. Well, this is a requirement uh, due to the direct transfer of 225 million from the state into para uh, that each district share has to be recorded on their books. So this is just a, an accounting transaction, a flow through uh, that we have put into one fund uh, to be able to separate it out uh, so it doesn't kind of mess up trends on revenues and expenditures overall. Uh, with that, so we have a uh, budgeted option scheduled for January 28th, uh, the next board meeting. Uh, and then, of course, adjustments can always be made up through June 30th uh, if there's additional information that comes along. The end. Okay. Questions? Kathy? Are we doing averaging? Are we doing averaging since we're in declining? Yes. And what kind of impact does that have financially? Is it, I'm assuming it helps us a little bit. Uh, it's less bad. <laughs> But I'm <laughs> it it uh, averages in depending on whether you're in uh, two, three, four, five years uh, of decline. Uh, so it kind of pulls in those last few years. And uh, so the, the reduction in revenue is not as bad as the full loss of students. Are we two years in? How many years are we in averaging? Um, we are two years, although it was very slight, I think, uh, the year before. Uh, and it will happen again next year. Other questions? Well, thanks so much. It's great. All right. Our final item is agenda setting. Um, and this is where you could bring up a topic or say that you're going to submit an RFI, but let, let us all know what's on your mind. Thoughts? No? All right. Well, with that, I'd like to adjourn the meeting. <laughs>